If you are a game developer or designer, Rhythm Game is a great genre to explore. It's pretty minimalist, fun to play, and gives you a lot of artistic freedom for art and music. But is it easy to make? Well, it's not the worst. You don't have to deal with physics or camera, you can do it in 2D, there's no fighting, no enemy AI, no NPC, no inventory, no out of bound glitches. It spares you a lot of troubles actually. But it has a particular constraint, timing. A specificity of rhythm game that can surely be a real struggle. In this video I want to teach you how to design your code to make a rhythm game. I've made several small rhythm games through which I established a structure that can be used for all sorts of games. This tutorial will be framework and tool agnostic, you can use it with any engine. I won't focus on the code itself but rather the global logic and most importantly the component and structure you need. Before we delve into the subject, here are some fundamental principles that you must keep in mind when making a rhythm game. First, always schedule. You will have to handle a lot of events on the beat or at precise moments in your song. Do not wait for them to happen before making calculations. Plan events one bit in advance to execute the logic part. Then wait for the desired time to show the result on screen. This will allow you to better manage frame rate loss and even cancel events if necessary. Secondly, always use the music time as a reference. Avoid custom timers, or even worse, collision detection in the physics engine. Your music player likely has a property that tells in milliseconds at which time you are in the track. This is the value you must always use for the game logic, for the movement of screens, for scheduling. It corresponds to what the player is hearing, so it should be your only source of truth if you want to be in sync with the music. And finally, be generous in your error margin. The player won't be able to press button on the exact frame, some of them have worse senses of rhythm than others, and there can be all sorts of audio input delay depending on their hardware. I generally use a margin of 80 milliseconds before and after a beat. It can seem long, but trust me for a lot of players it isn't. You can also implement an audio calibration screen to calculate the delay to use, but that's another subject. Alright, with this in mind, let's dive into my structure for building a rhythm game. This structure more or less follows a domain-driven design logic. It is made of several components, usually class instance, each having their own scope and responsibilities. All of these components follow these rules. They each have a single role and mission, or a scope, they are independent from each other and can even run isolated, and they read input and write output using events. They subscribe to their input at the start and emit their output during their life cycle. So how do these components communicate with each other? Generally, they are plugged to one or several store, a singleton class that contains the game's data and a bit of logic to update them. The components in the game react to events coming from the store and triggers others by updating it. But for keeping this video understandable, we'll pretend that the components interact with each other using their own events. This design has a lot of advantages for games. It's modular, robust, and easy to debug. It also makes the code easier to understand, because each component only does a single job. So we'll explore these components one by one and explain what they do. The first component is the player input, which has the very basic mission of listening to the player's action. When the player presses a button, player input emits an event telling the button that was just pressed. And that's it, you barely need more than one line of code, it's really a small component. The next one also doesn't have a lot of responsibilities, it's the music player, which is here to play music. You give it a new track, it plays it. But there's a bit more to it, because this component is also responsible for every dynamic music logic, and you'll likely have dynamic music at some point. So if after an event in the game you want to play a music cue, you'll have that guy. If you want to add a new instrument layer, it's that guy. Adding an audio effect, that guy. Switching to a new track, that guy. Its implementation depends on which audio tool you use, but if you're using an engine like Wise or FFMOD, the music player should be the interface with them. It also has another small responsibility. At every frame, the music player must indicate the time position in the song, preferably in milliseconds or smaller. It only writes it in the store for someone else to read it. That someone being the metronome. Its job is to count the beats. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Again, small scope. Depending on how your song is structured, the metronome will count beat, but also bars or some parts. Basically, its task is to tell where we are in the chart. Its implementation is at first not too complicated, although as your game evolves there might be some particular scheduling logic that can get tricky. But the fundamental is this. You give the metronome the BPM of the song, which means beat per minute. 
From that, you can calculate the duration in seconds of a quarter note, which is 60 divided by BPM. If you're like me and need a clue to remember in which order you put these values, keep in mind that the higher the BPM is, the shorter the beat duration will be, so the BPM has to be the divider. This is the time for quarter notes, but if you need more precision, you can divide it to obtain 8th notes, 12th notes, 16th, depending on the needs. Once the metronome has that, when the song starts, it initializes two values, the last beat, with 0, and the next beat position, with the beat's duration, that you can multiply by 1000 to be in milliseconds. Then, at every frame, it reads the music position given by the music player. Once it's equal or past next beat position, it increments last beat by 1 and emits its values as an event. It also updates next beat position by incrementing it with the beat duration. And then we repeat. With this, we have a metronome that emits regular beat events synchronized to the music. It will be very useful to trigger actions on rhythm, like animations. But it will also be a fundamental part of the game's logic, because it allows to know the current beat at any time. Although we also need to implement the error margin. As I said, we can't ask player to react on the exact frame a beat occurs, so there needs to be a short period before and after the beat when we consider it active. Let's add another property to metronome. Active beat. The idea is that when the music time position is inside the margin of a beat, active beat will return this beat value. Otherwise, it will return null or a negative response. I like to think of it as a window with stores. When the stores are closed, it means we are between beats. Then it opens shortly before a bit, giving its values. Then once the bit is passed, it closes again. It repeats this during the entire song. If someone asks for the active bit value when it's closed, they obtain nothing. And if it's open, then they read the current active bit. It must also emit events when the window opens and when the window closes, each time by precising for which bit. This will be useful for later. You can implement this window basically the same way you already implemented the bit counting. You will need two other values on top of next bit position, active bit start position and active bit end position, which you obtain by subtracting and adding the margin. Next component, the composer. Its role is far more simple. It's the one who writes the charts. Not the actual music charts, of course, but the one describing the input to play. Its task is to write a document that tells which buttons must be pressed on which beats in the song. It's the level design output. It can work in several different ways, depending on the kind of game you want to make. Maybe your level has a fixed chart, in which case the composer will just write it once at the start of the level and be done for the day. Or maybe your game is more dynamic and has a chart that needs to be updating during the level. Maybe your game even uses procedural generation. In any case, the composer is the reference to check to read the current chart. Most importantly, it must be able at all time to answer the question what is the next required input for the player, which means what is the next button they must press and on which beat. This information is crucial for the next component, the judge. The judge is the entity that validates players' actions, deciding if they are successful or failing. The way it does that is first by asking the composer for the next input. As we said, it gets one button and one beat position. Let's call it the current goal. Then it waits for an event from player input. Once it has it, it first compares the press button to the required one, and if it's not similar, then the goal is failed. Otherwise, it turns toward the metronome to ask it what is the current active beat. If the active beat window is closed, it means that we are not on a valid beat, and thus the goal is failed. If the window is open but on a beat that is different from the goal's one, then it's also failed. The only accepted input is one with the button specified by the goal happening on the same beat. But wait, the judge doesn't only listen to players' input events, it also pays attention to the metronome window's closing event. Because if the window closes on the recurrent beat, that means that the player didn't react in time, and now they are too late, so they fail again. The judge doesn't keep any score, it just emits two kinds of events, failure or success. Once it has done that for a goal, it asks the composer for the next one and wait for an event to emit its verdict. It just repeats that until the end of the level. Then comes the one component that will pull everything together, the referee. Its role is both a simple one and a very large one, applying the game's rules. The referee is the only one to be aware of these rules. It's the one that makes the whole game run. That's why I sometimes call it game manager, although it's a name I try to avoid now because I find it too generic. The referee doesn't perform any logic, it lets that to all other components, but it coordinates them so that they work together. It's just the only component that depends on the other. 
it's kinda at the top, running between everyone to give instructions. At the start of the level, it gives the track to play to the music player, the BPM to the metronome, and the level's data to the composer before telling everyone that the game is starting. Then during the game, it listens to the judges' event to keep scores according to the game's rules. Its behavior depends entirely on how your game works. It can keep track of the player health bar and declare the game over if it reaches zero. On the other side, it can also detect a combo and double the player score. If your level is dynamic, it's also the one deciding if we go to the next section and selecting it. Finally, it also has the responsibility to stop the level. Again, this depends on how your game works. It can be done at the end of the track, in which case the referee will wait for an event from the music player, or your song could be a loop and the level ends after a certain number of bars, thus the referee will count the metronome's event. Or it can even be special objectives, given either by the charge from the composer or the amount of success or failures that the judges emit. In any case, once this happens, the referee must emit a non-level event. So that the player input stop listening, the music player stop playing, the metronome stop counting, the composer stop uh, whatever it's doing right now, and the judge just shut up. Then the referee computes the player final score, and it's a wrap everyone. We play the level from beginning to end. The last piece to add to the picture is the display. It's called showing everything on screen. Yeah, so far we've only defined the logic and sure, the music, but it's better if your player has some visual information, right? So the display will just subscribe to the events we defined and show them on the screen. It will read the charts from the composer and combine it with the metronome or even the music player data to display the notes in real time. It will then create visual feedback on the judges' events by triggering animations on success or failure events. And finally, whenever the referee updates the score or any game data, the display will update it on screen as well. Note that display never takes any decision, nor does it emit events used by the others. It's a mindless component that comes at the end of the chain to show the data that is being fed to it. In fact, you probably won't have a display class in your code. It will most likely be several visual components in your scene, depending on how you want to present your game. There are, after all, many, many ways to design a rhythm game. And with all that, you should have the ground basis to build yours. Now, these are just fundamental pillars that you likely have to adapt for the kind of game you want to make. These logic components are an efficient way to build a rhythm game. This distribution of rules helps a lot to put everything together. But you might want to adapt it according to your needs. Maybe you won't need a composer, or maybe you will need it to also be the judge in real time. Maybe you don't want to charge to just follow a metronome, but the precise song data from the music player. Maybe you need more than one referee for several systems in your game, like enemies or hazard, each one with their own composer and judge. It can also be possible that your rhythm game borrows from other action genres, and you will actually need collision detection on top of everything. The structure that I described is only the foundation for rhythm mechanics. It is then up to you to build the full game that goes on top of it. I hope that this tutorial was useful and will help you to create engaging rhythm games. If you want more advanced tutorials about rhythm games, like how to implement an audio calibration setting or build a rhythm game with Wise, check out the links in the description. Don't hesitate to subscribe if you'd like more videos about musical game development. In any case, thank you very much for watching. See you next time.